Hello and welcome back to Biber Hunter Scale Models. In this video I want to show you how I painted the Panther tank I built in the last video and how I created a worn out uh, distressed camouflage and painted details like chipped off the merit or metal chipping. So take a seat and let's get started. Okay, this is where we left after the last video and I could upgrade the running gear a bit because a friend of mine printed me some more detailed running wheels and some hubs for the running gear. And I added some small shell impacts or bullet damage to the tube because it was too clean for me. For better handling while painting I disassembled everything and removed all loose parts. And before I started painting I washed the whole model and every piece to remove dust from sanding, grease from my fingers and make sure the paint adheres well to the model. And I made it very carefully obviously. I then placed every part on a toothpick or a cocktail stick either by gluing or sticking. And because I don't have a fancy scale model holder I used some screws and nuts for the hull and the turret. Here I glue the nut to the turret so I can remove the screw if needed and place the turret on the hull. And with my DIY scale model holder and everything placed on something I could finally put the first paint on it. But first metal primer. Because I used a lot of photo etched and metal parts on this model I wanted to make sure the paint adheres well to the metal. In the past I had sometimes problems with paint chipping off from metal parts and I wanted to give the metal primer by Tamiya a try here for the first time. And so far I can say that I have no problems with paint chipping off and it worked out pretty well. And because I didn't want to touch all the small and tiny photo edge parts with a brush I decided to apply it with my old airbrush and it worked out pretty well too. Just in the cup undiluted and here we go. Because I wasn't in the mood for a 3 hour airbrush priming session I went the lazy way here and used Vallejo's Rattlecan primer. You can achieve excellent results if you apply it carefully and don't flood the surface. Then it was finally time for the first paint and I started by applying deck tan on all Zimmerit surfaces. This will be the foundation for the later distressed and worn out surface and a lot of chipping medium will be involved in this process. My plan here was to avoid post or pre-shading and try a different approach to this and I was somehow hoping to maybe find a better or more effective way. Now looking back I wouldn't say that this is a very effective or time saving way but the result was very interesting to me and I'm looking forward to show you the process. In the next step I grabbed me the later base paint, the dark yellow and lighten it up with a lot of white until I get a really bright yellow. And with this mix I then sprayed every metal surface. And here you can see I used some masking tape on the swing arms to avoid paint building up there and I don't end up with fitting problems later when I want to install the running gears. I only used it while I was airbrushing and I removed it after I finished the airbrush stage. To avoid unnecessary overspray I gently painted smaller pieces by brush. I just felt that this was a more easy way using a brush here than being very 
extra precise with my airbrush and this could uh, also save me some time maybe. And after all the previous layers were fully dry, I applied the first two layers of chipping medium. The chipping medium was diluted with airbrush thinner and then applied with my older airbrush and I made two more or less thick or thin layers on every part that was painted. When the chipping medium was dry, I sprayed the pure dark yellow over the whole model. This was a pleasant step as it hides all the strange looking underlayers and unifies the surface. And here again all parts like the side skirts and the wheels were painted in the same way. Then it was time for the first chipping effects and to bring some optical interest into the surface. When the dark yellow was completely dry I reactivated it with a soft brush and water. Then I used softer and harder brushes to scrap away the reactivated paint and let the underlayers show through. This was more work on the zimmered surfaces as the paint had more grip there, but on the metal surfaces this was not uh, hard work. The idea here was not to create actual shipping yet, but to give the surface a worn out and distracted look. Before I moved on to the camouflage, I saved my work with two coats of rattle can varnish and when this was dry I again applied two coats of chipping medium. Then I could finally start spraying the camouflage and I again started with lightened up red brown. I sprayed the camouflage using some reference pictures but without any liquid mask or masking in general. I used liquid mask on an earlier work of mine and although the result was very good I needed almost two days to peel the stuff off. So I was hoping to be a bit more time effective here and maybe create the look of a field applied camouflage without the sharp edges. And as you can see I'm already spraying the lightened up dark green and always hoping to make a pattern that makes somehow sense. Thanks to the chipping medium I could remove some overspray and rework the shape of the camouflage where I wasn't happy. And I could disclose some of the chipped off and damaged zimmerit I sprayed on the first step. After drying and then again two coats of chipping medium, I then could spray the red brown and the dark green on top of the lighter tones. Again like in the first steps the paint was very strong diluted and I sprayed at a very low pressure. And this time it was more easy because I could follow the pattern I created in the step before and I didn't have to think too much into the camouflage. And again after the paint had time to dry I reactivated it with water and you can already see that the paint react with my water brush because it was sprayed so thin. I had to be very careful and gentle here to not remove the dark coat completely and end up with just the lighter one. But I could already see that I was heading in the right direction and I liked the result and I guess uh, all the steps and all the work were some kind worth the effort. I said it in the beginning of the video this is maybe not the most effective way to spray and create a camouflage but I like the result and uh, the lighter paint shining through the darker coat and uh, in the end it was a, a good experience to 
work this way with all those coats of chipping medium. Of course you can achieve similar results with using cheaper hairspray, but it turned out to be less controllable to me and uh, the combination of Tamiya paints and chipping medium turned out to be the best approach for jobs like these. At least for me. I wasn't really happy with the look of the green spots because they turned out too greyish for me. So I mixed me a bright green glaze consisting of paint, some airbrush thinner and a lot of retarder. This was then applied in two very thin layers with an almost, almost dry brush to not flood the surface and all the details. And with a soft brush moistened with retarder I could then blend the paint into the surface. I didn't use water for this mixture because it would dry too fast and leave some tight marks and by using retarder and airbrush thinner I could avoid exactly this. I think my mistake was to use white to lighten up the dark green and I should have chosen the bright yellow for example. But as you can see here it's almost never too late or impossible to correct mistakes and I take it as a lesson learned. And this step with the bright green brought another level of depth to the camouflage and I was almost happy that I had to make this step here. And to me it's better to be happy with the result than being sorry afterwards. And this is the result after hours of airbrushing, a small correction and I could now finally move on to the detail painting. I started with the places where the zimmerit was chipped off and the oxide primer underneath was exposed. And to receive a matte finish I mixed some ultramat varnish into the paint. This step finally brought some details and variation into the surface and although it's looking very dominant right now this will be toned down with the later steps. And at least by now it should be visible that I'm a fan of battle hardened vehicles which are uh, pretty beaten up and don't look too new. It was at this point that I realized I almost forgot to apply the decals, a job I'm never looking forward to. So I quickly applied some glossy varnish by airbrush onto the places where the decals will be. And after placing them on the model with water I soaked them with decal softener. After letting them sit for a few minutes I dried them and applied decal fix to integrate them even more into the surface. I then worked the decal into the surface with a soft brush and again applied some decal fix and let it dry untouched. The turret number by the way is not from the Panther kit but from an old one I had in my stash. I used them because they were a bit smaller than the ones from the kit and easier to apply around the side hatches. And because this vehicle is some kind of fictional in every way and the numbers will be almost completely hidden by the spare tracks, this was a compromise I can live with and sleep at night. And here I am trying to apply the Balken coils around a shell impact. After the decals had time to completely dry I applied two coats of satin varnish. This coat has two jobs. The first job is to protect and seal the decals and integrate them even more into the surface. And the second job is to create a nice smooth surface for later oil and enamels. It's much easier to blend oils and enamels on a glossy or satin surface and because I don't want a glossy surface I use satin varnish here. And this is the result and I think it's good enough to be hidden under the spare tracks. Now I could start to 
refine the places where the Zimmerit flaked off. And I here use deck tent to outline these areas and imply the edges of the broken Zimmerit. The paint was also diluted with retarder here and with a retarder moistened brush I could then blend the paint into the surface and remove areas where too much paint accumulated. Bigger areas like the fenders or the back storage box were a bit more tricky and I tried to imply a pattern with more or less leftovers from the Zimmerit. I then tried to recreate the pattern that was left by the flaking of Zimmerit square tiles and these leftovers of the square tile pattern were mainly painted in the bigger areas where the oxide primer was exposed. I again got my inspiration here from Uncle Nightshift's Jagd Painter because I liked his result and I tried to create my own version here. To create some random Zimmerit chips I used a sponge and very gently touched the surface here and there and tried to highlight the more exposed and raised uh, Zimmerit areas. And I used a pointy brush to simulate chipped edges of the square tiles and to bring a bit more of a pattern and maybe some sense into the chipping. To be honest, at this point I'm not sure if I'm happy with the look of the Zimmerit surface. It looks very bright to me because of all the deck tan. Maybe because I overdid it a bit with all the exposed oxide primer areas and I hope that will be coming together after weathering and our detail painting. So the deck tan gets toned down a bit. And to speed up the chipping progress a bit and add some more randomness, I used the speckling method to add uh, random and smaller chips. And any unwanted specks were immediately removed with a moistened brush. Then it was finally time for one of my favorite techniques, metal chipping. I started with the lighter ships and herefore used a bright yellow and lighten it up with white even more. I grabbed me a small sponge, placed it in a self-holding tweezer and unloaded it on the napkin until it was almost dry. I then started to apply the light metal chips on every metal surface by gently touching and dipping the sponge onto it. It's a good thing to start early with this technique because it can be a bit messy and if you hit any unwanted places you can later paint them in the detail painting stage. And if there were chips that were too big or out of shape I could immediately remove them with a moistened brush. It's also a good idea to turn and twist the sponge from time to time to not accidentally create a pattern that can result from not turning it. And I here again slightly diluted the paint and applied some more chips by using the speckling method. This again brought some variation and randomness into the sponge applied chips and speed up the whole process a bit. And again specks that were too big or out of shape or landed on places where they shouldn't land were removed with a moistened brush immediately. And for some light chips on the bigger oxide primer areas I mixed me a matching paint and applied it also by sponge. For the metal chips I mixed me a dark brown paint and diluted it with 3 drops of Vitara. My goal here was to mix me a darker brown than I used on the camouflage so it is at least a bit better be seen. And with a pointy brush which was not 
fully overloaded with paint, I started to fill in the light chips and to highlight race spots like screws or bolts with the darker paint. This is of course a very time consuming technique, but it's totally worth the effort. It almost adds a three dimensional look to the chips and it brings so much for the surface details. And to not get overwhelmed by the amount of chips I had to do here, I started to work on specific areas and do them piece by piece. It's also kind of therapeutic to work uh, your way through the model like this and I always enjoy doing metal chips like this and I think that this is one of my favorite techniques. As you can see the chips are obviously more visible on the lighter areas and I almost regret it a bit that I didn't make the camouflage a bit more yellowish. Another option would have been to create bigger chips, but I didn't want to take the risk of creating out of scale chips. I used neutral grey to base paint all bare metal parts. This is a foundation for later oil and enamel rust effects. And at least to me it improved the look of the model a lot because it brought some new variation and some new paint to the still a bit monotone looking model. And because of that I decided to paint more parts like the side skirt holders or the openings of the hedges to add some more details and rust effects to the model. These hedges are areas with a lot of movement and traffic so it might be looking good to add some more rust and shiny metal effects later. And I painted the rubber parts of the running wheels in the same grey tone and they will be weathered and dusted later in the weathering stage. With AK's natural steel I painted all blank parts of the running gear like the contact points of the running wheels or the idler wheel. And as a last step for today I used dark grey to paint uh, the areas around the shell impacts for later enamel weathering. And this too was a bit helpful for the look of the model, at least to me. And with that we made it for today. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it a bit interesting to watch. I will finish this video with mixed feelings because I'm not really sure in which direction this model is heading. And I hope after the enamel and weathering stage I will be wiser if I screwed it up or if I'm on the right way. Stay tuned for the next part of this series to see if I screw the model completely or if I can improve it with enamel weathering, a pin wash and painting last details like the big canvas. But enough talking from me for now. Thank you again, stay safe and goodbye.